I hope you're looking forward to that day. Gather around the throne of God with all those who have gone before us. We can only imagine. I invite you to take your Bibles, turn to the Song of Solomon, chapter 8. While you're turning there, let me just uh, also remind you, slipped my mind while I was standing there, don't forget to pray for Miss Boots, uh, Sylvia Nelson, if you will. Uh, she's battling bronchitis, all that kind of stuff too. Uh, she's at home today, but I encourage you to keep uh, Miss Boots in your prayers. Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Some of you like to read books. You ever got ever been reading a book and you thought, just let me turn to the end and just find out how it ends, right? You ever done that? Song of Solomon chapter 8. We have two verses that basically he's been trying to tell us the whole thing. And here's what he says. If you could have just got these two verses, you would have thought, oh, okay, now I understand. Kind of brings it into conclusion. We've talked about what the love of Christ is about to us, to the church, that the church is actually the bride of Jesus Christ and how He looks at His bride that one day will be brought to Him. As Brother Chris just sang about, one day we will be called up to meet the bride of Christ. The church will be called, called up to see the bridegroom. He will call us home to the marriage supper of the Lamb and there we will be with Him forever. One day that will happen in the intense love affair that Christ has with the church and because He has an intense love affair with the church, He has an intense love affair with the Christian, the body of Christ as well. So that's the question we have today, understanding that love through this depiction or this picture that we've been given of the love between a man and a woman, a woman and a man, the relationship that they have in the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon chapter 8, read me verses 6 and 7. Here's what it says, Set me a seal upon thine heart, as a seal as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are the coals of fire, which have the most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly condemned. That means despised. So these verses almost kind of sum up the essence of this love that we've been talking about over the last several weeks. I think it's probably, if you look at these two verses, you see the theme probably of the entire song that Solomon writes for us, the description of true love. Here is the triumph of love that we see, I think both in the human realm and in, I think, properly related to the love of man should have for Christ, and Christ has for His church as well. So He gives us a description of it. Now let me say this before we get into it. We, we have abused, I, I know that's a strong term, but we have abused the word love in our culture. <laughs> you know, I love potato chips, really. You love potato chips? Well, yeah, I love them. I, so you couldn't live without potato chips. You'd sacrifice a lot of other things, so you'd have. We have a tendency to abuse that word in a lot of different ways in our culture. Uh, we've allowed culture to define what love is, and most of the time, when culture defines what love is, is really, really better. They use, should use the word lust than love. It, it's a. It, it becomes almost just this uncontrollable desire or passion that's there and it leaves out the sacrificial part of love and the disciplined part of love and the enduring part of love. So there again, society, the culture we live in now has come to a point where they really begin to abuse this word. And for us to grasp it and understand it, we you know, understand really what it means, I think both in the human realm and even in the spiritual realm, we've got to go back to how it's defined in Scripture. Because we understand God is love. And love is of God. So if God created this, and God was the first one to truly understand, and I believe this, to know how to express that love, you understand the creation of this world was an expression of God's love. The creation of man. All of those things are expressions of God's love. So God, who is love, defined by, there He is, 
God has now expressed that and He's shown us what that means. So He's saying now, what does that mean to you? How do you live that out? So to understand what this love is, what we use the term to mean, we've got to look at it biblically. Notice what the text says, and we're going to talk about several characteristics of that love, not completely defining it, because I don't think we ever can completely define what love is. But there again, we're going to get some characteristics of it. A checklist, maybe, that we can look at in our lives and say, this is how God loves me, but the better question is, how do I love God? That's where we've got to get come back across. We're going to understand the characteristics of love, but the question we've got to answer in our lives today is, how do I love God? That's the bigger question. So look at some of the characteristics that he gives us here. And we're going to go through the text, verses 6 and 7, for a minute. Probably the one that stood out immediately to you, and it did to me, was this. It's strength. It is as strong as what? Death. Death is strong. Do you know that? You can't stop it. We've tried to in a lot of different ways, but we can't. Even in Psalm 90, the Apostle Paul, I mean, not the, David and writes in Psalm 90, he describes this power of death. And he says our years are numbered and all the things that are there as God controls death in our lives. But he said this it's a powerful force in the world today. That's what death is. But if you read here in the Song of Solomon, as powerful as death is, love is also all-powerful. It's a universal force. It's a godly force. It is a force that can change and control all of man. That's what love can do. So is death powerful? Solomon in all of his wisdom said yes, but there's something more powerful than death. It is love. Love is an irrepressible force. Think about it for a minute. Man's love for money, power, control, and even a love for a woman has caused wars in our culture today. Did you know that? Go back and read in history. That desire for love, that desire of power, money. Go back and even to the Roman culture. There again, the love of a woman has caused wars. You can't repress it in any way. But understand, Christ has proved that His love for man is there again and again and again. The love of Christ is unstoppable. It's all-powerful. And it's even stronger than death itself. Think about it just for a minute in the cross. Christ's physical death, even the death of the cross, did not stop His love for mankind. You think about it. That day on the cross... The Son of God hanging in there suffering for our sins. At any point in time, Christ could have said, enough is enough. God could have looked down and said, enough is enough. What kept Christ on that cross? It was the love that He has for me and you. It was the love. It, 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 it wasn't something that, there again, He enjoyed. It wasn't something that He wanted to do. He said what? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Why? To die for our sins. It was the love of God that kept Christ there on that cross. So even the death, the death of the cross, could not stop this intense love that God has for you. We know that man's love for Christ has proven stronger than even death. Many people read through the Scriptures Many people read through early church history. Many people, even today across our mission fields, are giving their life for the love of Jesus Christ. It's hard for us to grasp the truth today that there are people being put to death because they love Jesus Christ. That's happening in our world today. There are people who are suffering. They are dying for their faith, their love for Jesus Christ. So we know the power of this love. Most of the Gospel writers, we understand, they died because of their passion to preach Jesus Christ and to know Jesus Christ. It is that love. Think about it for a minute. Our spirit, we were dead 
dead in the trespasses of our sins. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, and it had, listen to me, our sins put us to, at that point of death. But it, our sins will not, listen to me, but our sins will not be too strong for the power of Christ's love. I encourage you, read Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says this, but God commended His love toward us. He demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why would Christ die? Because He loves us. So even in all our sin, listen to me, I don't know where you've been, I don't know where you're at right now in your relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know how deep your sin is, how dark your sin is, I don't know how private your sin is, but I'm here to tell you this, nothing is greater than the love of Jesus Christ. He still loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, listen to me. David, King David, Old Testament, read it. God loved him. He was a murderer. He was an adulterer. But yet David described as a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he loved God and God loved him. So even in the depth of all of that sin, guess what? God's love never faltered for David. Listen to me, folks. God's love, that all-powerful love, loves you. It's stronger than death. Physical death and spiritual death, that love is stronger. Romans chapter 8, verses 35-39. through 39. Have you ever read that text? Isn't it amazing what it says there as Paul tries to describe this love? I hasten not to read it because it's a longer text, but I've got to read it to you. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 8, verses 35-39. through 39. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword... And it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted sheep as sheep for slaughter. It's a battle we're in. Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through Him that what? Loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor things, angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the what? Love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you're here this morning, listen to me, and if the world has told you, or your friends are told you, or your family, or, Lord help me, some church somewhere has told you that God does not or cannot love you, they are wrong. God loves you. Go back to our text. That love is not strong, but it is tenacious. The word jealousy there in verse 6 reminds us of that. When we see the word tenacious, often it carries a, a mean connotation. I think of a tenacious dog. <laughs> He's just going to hold on for dear life and tear you apart. Or some other animal. But here the word means intense or passionate love. This is a love that is spoken about throughout the book of Song of Solomon. In its cruel meaning, it's firm and tenacious and unyielding as the grave. But the grave does not give up its dead. Remember that. So how can we hold anything back from the grave? You see, what they're trying to get us to understand is, Solomon is trying to get us to understand is, love holds tight to that which it loves. Think about in the parental love of a, a parents to a child or even uh, the love relationship in a marriage. That's why we use the phrase in those uh, vows that you exchange, till death do us part. Why? It is a love that does not let go. No matter what it battles, no matter what it goes through, it is tenacious. It holds on. It endures, is what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. It beareth long. It does not give up. It's intense. Passionate. You're not going to deny it in any way. That's what the grave... Folks, we can battle it. We can try to deny it. As one man said, there are only two things sure in life, death and taxes. 
We just made it through taxes. I don't know about death yet. But this love that Christ has for us is an unyielding love. It is a passionate love. It is an intense love. Folks, if you go back and read through the book of Acts, and I encourage you to do that sometime, look how that love that the church or the believers there had for Jesus Christ is lived out. They endured persecution, many of them facing death. Why? Because they loved Christ. They would not quit. If you remember, many of the Jewish believers, they were abandoned by their family. They lost all economic ways way to make money or make a living. Why? Because no one would do business with them when they claimed that they were a Christian. Many of them, their families walked away from them because of their belief in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. But their love was so passionate, it was so intense for this one called Jesus Christ that they said, no matter what you do, I will not quit loving Christ. Do we have that kind of love? Is that the way that we love Jesus Christ? Because we know that's the way that He loves us. You see, in every, and if you read through church history, everything possible has been done to the church and the believers to tell us that Christ's love is not worth it. In fact, if you think about it, the execution of Jesus Christ Himself was there to tell us that, listen, it's not worth it. Don't face death because you love Christ. Dying, is that worth this love? This passionate love that you have? Is dying worth that? It was questioned in every corner. Folks, listen to me. Laws have been passed. Governments have been banned us from doing things, even banned the Gospel of Jesus Christ. They banned churches meeting. Christians have been imprisoned and even killed. But listen to me, their love for Christ has never wavered. In fact, listen to me, it has gotten stronger. I don't often tell you about this, jot this down. You may want to go look sometime. There's a wonderful resource out there called The Voice of the Martyrs. It's a wonderful account, and it tells every month accounts of how Christians are enduring intense persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ. Say, Brother Mark, why would I want to read them kind of stories? Because it tells us, listen to me, we're... We got it easy here. We take for granted what we have. We say we love Jesus. We sing about our love for Jesus. But it's a whole lot different when that love is challenged physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, spiritually. Do you love that way? Let me move you to one more. Because read back in our text, it said there again, this kind of love is, it, it deals with fire. As cruel as the grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire. It's intense. Fire is a powerful force. It can melt, it can fuse things together, it can subdue anything that it comes in contact with. Most anything that it comes in contact with falls underneath its power. We know that very well. In fact, if you read just over the news articles over the last week or so, the volcano that erupted, the fire that come down erupting out of that mountain, nothing could stop it, nothing could control it. It destroyed everything in its path. You couldn't build a wall to stop it, you couldn't build a home to stop it, a road couldn't stop it, nothing can stop that intense fire that was erupting out of that volcano. Now think about it for a minute. Can that apply to human love and God's love for us as well? You see, sometimes God's love is cruel. Brother Mark, what do you mean by that? Because sometimes He disciplines us, right? (laughs) I don't say it's cruel mean, but I say it's cruel because we don't like to be disciplined. (laughs) I mean, look at our culture today. We don't like discipline, do we? We see that throughout our culture in a lot of different ways. But remember when Jesus Christ was talking to Peter? Peter had just denied Him. Christ, remember that night before He would face death, He said, Peter, you're going to deny Me. And Peter said, nah, not Me. (laughs) I'm good, Lord. In fact, you know what Peter said? I'll die before I deny You. Didn't he do that? And immediately the first time when he denied Him, Peter immediately caught the eyes of Jesus Christ. Guess what? He knew it. 
I done messed up. That one look of love looked at Peter and said, Peter, I hadn't forgotten you, but I know what you just did. Why did you do it, Peter? The Apostle Paul, you know, with Saul in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus, when he met Jesus Christ there that day, fell on his knees. He realized what he had been doing the whole time was denying Jesus Christ. The very one who loved him. Paul realized that. Saul realized that. It was a hard time. Changed his whole way of thinking. Changed everything that he had planned to do. Changed everything that he was so intensely passionate about. Changed his life completely when he came in contact with that disciplining love of Jesus Christ. Parents here today, listen to me. You know why you discipline your children. Not because you enjoy it, but because why? You love them. Now let me say something. I remember being a child one time. I do remember facing some difficulties in my life and being corrected by my parents. Now parents, I'll be honest with you. I'm just going to say this on behalf of children everywhere. Before you discipline your children, please don't say this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. You're just, you're just telling a lie. You're just telling a lie. Because when you get disciplined, listen to me, it hurts if you do it right. I'm telling you, I've been there down that path. I know you don't want to discipline them, but I want you to understand that's part of what love is all about, that disciplining love. And just as God disciplines us, He does it because He loves us. Intently and intensely, He loves us. In Acts chapter 9, many of them faced their death. If you read through there, many of them faced their death because of their love for Christ. Folks, as I read through the book of Acts, it's an amazing thing. This fire, the baptism of fire that's spoke about in Luke chapter 12, could not be stopped. What is that baptism of fire that I'm talking about? It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Folks, I'm here to tell you this morning, when the Holy Spirit begins to move and He begins to work in your life, it will be an intense and you will not be able to stop it. I wish, there again, I know we're good, fundamental, friendly, free will Baptist. We're evangelical. But I'm afraid most of us, in our complacency and our fear sometimes, we don't let the Holy Spirit do its work in our life. And there's a lot of times we look around and we say, Oh, Brother Mark, I wish I'd done that, or I wish I'd spoken here, or I wish I would express my. Listen to me, folks. I'm convinced when the Holy Spirit begins to work in a person or in the body of Christ or in a church, listen to me, you won't be able to stop it and you won't be able to restrain it. Now, the problem is, folks, you've got to want the Holy Spirit to work in your life. You got to want the Holy Spirit to be in this church and be in this community and allow us to change and set this world on fire for Christ. We don't pray for that. Why? We like to be content. We're satisfied. We're, we like where we're at. We like what we're doing. We just don't want to see things change. Folks, I want you to understand when the Holy Spirit comes on the scene, everything changes. Read Acts chapter 2. When He came on the scene, everything changed. People began to surrender their life, surrender their possessions, surrender everything what, to Jesus Christ. And it made an impact on the world. Read there in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 were brought to the church daily. Come to know Christ as their Savior. How did that happen? Because of the fire of the Holy Spirit that consumed the church and consumed believers. See, that's what the love of God does. That's what the love of Jesus Christ will do in your life. Let me hasten on. Look in verse 7. It says this love is unquenchable. Did you catch that? Now he talked about fire and the consuming power of this fire. Then he says the term many waters in verse 7 which talks about an unquenchable fire or unquenchable love. This love, is, I think, is spoken once again about the... Psalm. And this is talking about a love that faces many obstacles along the way. Many people have tried to quench this kind of love, but were not successful. 
the love of Jesus Christ has for us and our love for Him should be this unquenchable love. You see, I'm convinced that the Satan and even the world will use fear, doubt, discouragement, lies, busyness, and even addictions to interfere with our love for Jesus Christ. You see, the world wants you to doubt it. The world does not want you to comprehend this love. The world does not want you to experience this love. So what will it do? It'll make, it'll, it'll make you live in a world. Listen, if you love Christ that way, you, that church is going to ask you to do some crazy stuff. If you love Jesus that way, I want you to understand, you're going to be giving away all your money. If you love Jesus that way, you're going to be in a mud hut in Africa somewhere trying to reach somebody for Jesus Christ. If you love Jesus that way, there's going to, listen, you ain't going to like that life. Because if you love Jesus that way, you're going to love your kids differently and your wife differently, and you're going, to, you're going to sacrifice some things that you think are important in your life. If you love Jesus that way, don't you do that. That's what the world's going to tell you. It's going to create fears and doubt in your mind. You can't love Jesus that way. You know what John told us in John chapter 1? He said that the love of the world is going to discourage us. The desires of the eyes is what he said. The desires of the flesh, the pride of life. All of those are dangerous for the love of God. See, John told us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The desires of the eyes. Don't love those. Why? Because it will take you from the love of God. Remember what Paul said. He said, listen, it's not money. It's the love of money that destroys you. It's not power. It's the love of power. It's not popularity. It's the love of that power that's going to destroy your life. It's going to destroy your love for God. Does what I love matter, Brother Mark? Does it, does it really impact my life? Yes, it does. The desires of the flesh, those things that you want, yeah, don't, ever, don't, don't raise your hand. You ever had somebody ask you after you've done something, why did you do that? And in your mind you were thinking, because I wanted to. <laughs> now, you didn't say it out loud. But in your mind, that's what you're saying. And they look at you and say, well, you knew it was wrong. You knew that was going to cause problems. You know that was not going to help you anywhere in life whatsoever. Why did you do it? And you're thinking in your mind, because I wanted to. Don't raise your hand. You've been there. You've been there, right? You see, that's, that's the love of the flesh. Because it felt good. I don't care that it caused problems. I don't care that it even separated me. I didn't care if God wanted me to do it or not. I wanted to do it. And so guess what? I did it. What are you telling me? You're telling me that you love that more than you love Christ. I love the feeling where addictions take me to more than I love Christ. I love the feeling of adultery more than I do Christ. Uh, let's get a little personal here. I love reeling in that big fish more than I do Christ on Sundays. Ooh, no amen right there, sorry. I love that extra hour of sleep instead of coming to Sunday school more than I love Christ. Uh, you, I'm, you know I'm going to go there sooner or later, so just, you might as well stay with me. I like eating an Outback better than I do McDonald's, so I can't tithe, so I love the Christ. Mm. No, be honest, I, I, I'm just going to get personal here, so just, I, that's okay. You can boo me later. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? John says the love of the world, the desires of the eyes, the desires of the flesh, the pride of life will stop you from loving Jesus Christ. Now, I know what you're going to say, Brother Mark. You named all those things, but I still love Jesus. But hold a minute. Don't tell me you love Jesus. 
If those things are going through your mind and heart and you've made those kind of decisions, don't tell me you love Jesus because what you're doing is telling me more about what, whether you love Jesus than what you say. Isn't that right? Yes? This means yes. What you do tells me more about whether you love Jesus than what you say. i got a lot of people who say they love Jesus. They're not here today. Not because they can't be here because of health, but for other reasons. We're in church, to be honest. See, Satan himself tried to stop the love of Jesus Christ for man. Read Matthew chapter 4. He tempted him with those very same things, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Satan will try to tell you that your sin has stopped God's love for you. Your failures have stopped God's love for you. God cannot love you. Read Romans chapter 8 again. Listen to me. If you're struggling with this in your life, I would encourage you to do this. Memorize Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. And when he starts coming to you saying, listen to me, God doesn't love you or God can't love you, start quoting Scripture back to him. You know why I'm going to tell you to do that? Because read Matthew chapter 4. Jesus Christ did the same thing. And if it was good enough for Jesus, guess what? It's good enough for us. Read Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Quote it to him. Jesus don't love you, but God commended His love toward me that while I was a yet sinner, Christ died for me. God loves me. Don't tell me God doesn't love me. He does. You see, when you're going through a battle in your life, sometimes you need to remember God loves you. Satan's going to say, no, He don't. Or you wouldn't be going through that. If God loved you, you wouldn't have that battle. You'd be rich. You'd have all the health and wealth that you want if God loved you. God doesn't love you. That's what Satan's telling you. When the cross cries out, yes, I do. Look at the last thing there in the text. Verse 7 says this at the very end, if a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. If man would give, if man could gather everything that he obtained and try to buy this love, you couldn't. You see, the world tells us we can buy love. Did you know that? That's what pornography tells us. You can buy love. All the commercials basically we see that deal with other addictions that are out there, guess what? What is it telling you? That you can buy love. Listen, you put on this lipstick, they'll love you. What? You buy this outfit, they will love you in it. Really? You drive this car, all the girls will love you. You buy a new truck, the girls will love you. JJ's bought a truck. I'm, I, he's got one girl that loves him, that's all he needs. Isn't it amazing? That's what the world tells us. Listen, you, you can buy this. And God's Word very clearly says, no, you can't. You can't buy it. You can't bargain. Well, Lord, listen, I'll be faithful. I'll come to church to next Sunday. I promise I'll be there if you just get me through. You ever, don't, don't raise your hand. What are you trying to do? You're trying to bargain for God's love. Lord, I've been faithful. I've been honest. I've, been, I've done all these things. What are we doing? We're bargaining. Listen to me. You can't accumulate enough stuff to give to God to bargain for His love. You can't do it. Sorry. The world will tell you you can. There are even some churches out there that will tell you, listen to me, you can do enough to buy God's love. No, you can't. That seed of faith they want you to plant? No, 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 no. You can't buy God's love. Oh, you give me a hundred, I'll give you a thousand by the end of the week. You know what they're doing? They're buying God's love. You can't do that. So if you don't get a thousand, guess what? You don't, God don't love you? No. Listen to me. God's love is not for sale. Now, let me say something. I'm going to be kind as I say this. That truth needs to be applied to human love as well as Christian love. 
Young people, listen to me for a minute. Don't let anyone buy your love. With popularity, good times. You cannot be, listen to me, this is going to sound cruel, but you cannot be good enough for God to love you. He loves you just the way you are. And here's the great thing, and I started with this text, I'm going to end with it. God gives you His love. For God so loved the world that He gave. You can't earn it. You can't bargain for it. God gives it. God gives that love. So the question maybe is, do you love God? Well, most of us, if we're here in church, we're going to say, yes, Brother Mark, I love God. But maybe the question is, are these characteristics of your love? What does it take to quench your love for Christ? <laughs> A headache? <laughs> An extra hour of sleep? The desire for a new whatever? What does it stop take to stop your love for Jesus Christ? A bad day? Somebody cutting you off in traffic? A bad relationship? What does it take to stop your love for Christ? Just to feel good for a moment? Does that stop? You see, because what, what you're telling me is when I take those decisions <clears throat> and I make them in my life and they're wrong and they oppose what God wants, basically what I'm saying is, God, I don't love you that much. Several years ago, I was talking with a young man we were talking about him getting married. <laughs> Been dating this girl for some time, and I, I asked the question. I said, um, so "Are you in love?" And he said, "Well, I love her, but I don't know if I'm in love with her." And I stopped for a minute and said, "Hmm, I'm afraid that's where most Christians are living their life." We love Jesus. We're just not in love with Jesus. Because, you know, you notice them conversations that happen between two people dating at the end of the conversation. Most of the time they don't want to say it, but sometimes they'll say it, love you. But you know what? That love you is not what's going to get them through the hard parts of a relationship or even a marriage. It's when you are in love, passionately, pure, passionate, intense, unquenchable, unstoppable, that kind of love, that's the love that God is talking about in that marriage relationship and what He's talking about between us and Him and Him and the church. So my question to you this morning is, do you love Jesus? Or are you in love with Jesus? There's a difference. You see, love you, Jesus? That's the one that shows up. That's the one that does the right thing sometimes when it's convenient. But the one who is in love with Jesus Christ is the one that's going to start his day with Christ and end his day with Christ and make his decisions in his life based on his love for Jesus Christ. Not based on lust or passions or anything else. I'm going to make my decisions because I'm in love with Jesus Christ. I want to stay in love with Him. So I'm going to make decisions to create and nurture and build that love because I am in love with Him. You know what love you, Jesus, means? I show it when it's convenient. I do it when it's easy. I love Christ when it doesn't demand a sacrifice. That's love you, Jesus. But in love with you, Jesus... That's a whole different love. So are you in love with Jesus? If you're not, maybe there's some things you need to change in your life so that you are in love with Him. Because, listen to me, He is in love with you. Let's pray together.
Our Father, we thank You for the love of Christ. It's not casual. (laughs) It is not a casual love. It is intense. It is tenacious. It is unstoppable. It is powerful. That's the way You love us. And all You're asking us in return is to love You the same way. And that's what we want in every relationship that means anything to us. We want that kind of love when we get married. We want a love that says, till death do us part. We want a love that's irrepressible, unstoppable, that's passionate, that's tenacious, that is unquenchable, that's not casual, but it's, it's intense. That's what we want in our lives, our friendships, what we share with other believers. That's what You want us to love You with. And God, I'm afraid today that so many of us sing the songs about loving Jesus Christ, but we're not in love with Him. Because when it comes to sacrifice, when it comes to discipline, when it comes to commitment, we love the things of the world more than we love You. We'll say it, but we don't live it. Lord, help us this morning to fall in love with Jesus Christ. And for those that perhaps don't know Christ as their Savior, may they come today and accept You and experience that kind of love that they've never known before, not from a parent or a friend or anyone else. They feel like they're unlovable, and today, God, You love them and let them know that. But as Christians, God, I cry out with all that is in within me. Lord, help us to know what it means to be in love with You. Forsaking all others, forsaking all things to love You. Lord, help us to know what that means today. I'm going to ask you to stand with your head bowed, your eyes closed. The Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. I encourage you, Don't quench His Spirit. Do not stop His Spirit. Respond to what He's calling you today to do. Do you love Him? Are you in love with Him? As we sing, won't you come? Oh, how He loves you and me. Oh, how He loves you and me. He gave His life, what more could He give? Oh, how He loves you, oh, how He loves me, oh, how He loves you and me. Let me talk just for a moment. Listen to me, I I, I know, listen, I... Brother Mark, I love Jesus. I know what you're saying. I just ask you right now, in the quietness of this moment, is that what your life says? To your your friends, to your children, to this church, to this community, does your life say, I love Jesus Christ? That's the question you've got to ask. You know, words are, I know they're powerful, but sometimes they're so empty. Do you love Him today? Are you in love with Him? We're going to sing one more verse. This is for you. As we sing, please, won't you come? Jesus to Calvary did go. His love for mankind to show. What He did there brought hope from despair. Oh, how He loves you. Oh, how He loves me. Oh, how He loves you and me. Father, we thank for these that are gathered here and across this auditorium. Lord, help us to understand the love of Jesus Christ. And then, Lord, to love You. 
with that same kind of love. Lord, I know that's a high standard. It's a high bar to reach. But God, help us today to understand that love. Lord, thank You for loving us. And it's in Your precious name that we pray. All God's people said, Amen.